Hello, and welcome to our program, Growing in the Old Ways. All of the opinions expressed on this show are those of the hosts or guests and do not necessarily express the views of Pagan Pathways Temple or its affiliates. This podcast is all about community voices. Today, we'll be sharing a talk I had with Liz Williams back in April about her fantastic in-depth look into paganism in the British Isles. Her book is entitled Miracles of Our Own Making, The History of Paganism in the British Isles. Liz is also a prolific fantasy fiction writer and has written several pagan-themed fiction books. Liz's book release was delayed due to the pandemic, but we are happy to report her new book is now available, thus the revisitation of her interview. A link to her newest work will be available in the description. If you are enjoying this podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We can be found at patreon.com slash pagan pathways temple. If you want to join the conversation, but you don't want to contribute financially, we can be found at facebook.com slash groups slash Pagan Pathways Temple. We'll talk to you real soon, and in two weeks, we'll have another exciting interview with another member of the Pagan community just for you. I'll do that some other time. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start hitting the record now. Um... I uh, have kind of looked things over and, uh, you know, I I did uh, get a little bit into the book and I was able to kind of dig a few things out. Um, I'm going to keep it kind of short just because, you know, I I could go on for an hour and a half and I know this about myself and I know, especially uh, about uh, the occult and paganism in particular. Right, sure, yes. yes. So, yeah, so... um, so you're a well-known uh, fiction author. This is your first non-fiction uh, efforts, however. Is that correct? It is. It's my first non-fiction book, yes. Um, we did a couple of books called Diary of a Witchcraft Shop 1 and 2, which is about uh, we being my, myself and my partner, our own personal experiences. So they, that was kind of autobiographical. I wouldn't really call it non-fiction. <laughs> so this is my first proper non-fiction um, oh. book, yes. Awesome, awesome. And you were nominated for two Philip Dick Awards? Is that true? I think, yeah, two, two or three. Two or three. I think it might have been three. It's, it was two. That was back in the early 2000s when I started writing. So I'm primarily a science fiction and fantasy writer. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I, I tend to follow that as well. Um, so um, it's quite apparent that you've done a great deal of research into the history of the occult, uh, particularly in the UK. Do you have any interest in looking into paganism over here across the pond? I totally do, yeah. And I mean, the trouble with uh, miracles was that we had to limit it um, to Britain, and I couldn't even really cover Ireland because sometimes the situation in Ireland was very different. Oh, yeah. Um, and I couldn't really go into. It's just massive. It's such a massive subject. Right. And if I had um, been able to go into other countries, the book would be about the length of this room. Right. Just crazy because. You know, there's a lot of um, interesting stuff happening in the late 19th century in Paris, for example. You know, a lot of right. the same sort of people, uh, the same demographic, certainly, but actually some of the same characters moving to and fro across the pond, um, like Anna Bonus Kingsford and um, and Mathers himself. Yeah. And I couldn't really go into a lot of that uh, because I just didn't have space. Uh, so I had to kind of leave America out. America, it kind of is crying out for a, a similar book. Um, yes but has had some brilliant stuff done on it already. Actually, some really great stuff on, on mad, the history of magic in the States around. Um, but it's, again, it's a huge topic. Yeah. Um, so we had to really limit it, and I had to be really restrained in, in not going down the rabbit hole of, you know, goddess worship in San Francisco in the 1970s. Right. I'd love to have devoted more time to. Yeah, I mean, it'd be fascinating, but uh, definitely uh, would make for a much longer, longer read. You're I know, right about that. That's just the trouble. Maybe volume two. <laughs> volume two. <laughs> there it you was go. very interesting. I mean, it, it did um, it did open up a lot of areas that I, I started feeling I really should know more about this. I don't know enough about it. Um, and that was in relation to a lot of magical practice in the States and other places. Because the Golden Dawn um, went off, or a branch of it, went off to New Zealand. Oh. And it only really shut, it shut down in the 70s. But I think there is a group still going um, oh. in a little town in New Zealand. And this is a massive subject in itself. A guy called Tony Fuller has done a lot of research on this. And I hope he publishes it because he's still got, say, he's a Kiwi. He's still got some of the papers. Oh, um, wow. So that in itself, you know, is this, this stuff is just fascinating. It, it starts popping up, you know, all over the place. And you think, 
what were they doing out there? <laughs> but, you know, they emigrated or migrated. Um, a group of clergymen actually took the Golden Dawn materials out with them huh. to New Zealand and set up a temple. That's... Um, because, you know, and you're just like, wow, I don't know anything about this. <laughs> right. That's just fascinating. That's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I have no idea. There were lots of, there were lots of, there's lots of stuff like that um, that I, d- I didn't know about. You know, I've got a, something like a, pretty much a 30 year history in the occult world now um, but there's a lot of stuff that I didn't know about and that came to light when I was researching this book and we run an occult conference every year in Glastonbury and some of the stuff people come up with is just extraordinary yeah and it does make you realize how little you actually are aware of stuff um, and how much is out there right I, I, I yes absolutely I, I 100% get it um, now Funny thing, and this kind of ties into what we were just talking about in, in kind of a weird sort of if you cross your eyes sort of way. Um, have you spent yeah. any time on some of the newer social media platforms such as like TikTok and things like that? And uh, I've spent some time on there and it's just kind of alarming what some of these younger uh, pagans and witches believe to be true. Yes. Uh, it, yes. Have, yes. Have you spent any time with that? Like, <laughs> um, no, I haven't. But I'm on. I'm, a, I'm primarily on Facebook. But I have seen some forums, um, and and you just you know you cover your eyes. Really, it's just a train wreck. <laughs> yes. um, but I have to say, you know, when I was a young, when I was a young pagan back in the day, um, <laughs> really some total crap as well. You know, like the yeah. whole nine, nine million witches killed in the witch trials type thing. Right. No, that's not true. No, you know, uh, but I actually I, I didn't really question it for a couple of years, and I suddenly started thinking, you know, that is an awful lot of people. Is that actually accurate? And no, of course not. Right, you know, it's it's yeah. not. Yeah. Um, but there are definitely things, and I did sort of, sort of buy into the whole, you know, Easter comes from Eostra. She's an actual Germanic goddess. It seems like she's not. You know, people have been doing the research. Right. But I think the I, I said this on another podcast last week. The essential thing is to change your mind when you come up against new evidence, not cling on to the old beliefs. I've had to throw out so much stuff that I actually believed in right. and over the years. Um, you know, Because historical evidence changes, people do more research, they come up with stuff that you didn't know about, as we were just talking about. Yeah. Um, and rather than kind of clinging blindly onto a belief that because it's just because it's cherished and personal to you, you've got to get rid of it. Right, and I think I think that's why I devoted quite a large chunk of the introduction to this, talking about historical method and how to do it, because a lot of people aren't taught that. Not and, at know, all. Why no. would they know? Right. Why would they know if they're not taught it? Right. Um, you know, it takes it takes a lot of experience before you can start really thinking outside the box, and unless you have the toolkit to start thinking outside the box and the box to start with, right? <laughs> you know, it's really, it's really, yeah, it's really difficult. So I don't want to slam anybody. Right. But I, I certainly don't want to do that. Right. Um, or I, I, I don't want to play the sort of um, the, the wise elder thing. Of course, like, in my day, wouldn't believe all this nonsense, you know, do, 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 do fuck up. Um, that's really patronizing. Right. And, um, and a lot of the younger people are really going to bring something interesting in their own right to this particular party. But, yes. Um, yes, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and it's kind of all our job to get to grips with that, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Um, so I wanted to ask, and this, you, I, I don't know even if you know who this person is, but uh, how do you feel about the works of historical fiction such as the writings of Morgan Llewellyn? Okay, um, well, I think there's, there's definitely a role for um, fantasy to take things and mix it up and change it. And that's great. And I have actually read some of her. Um, I think there's a novel... <laughs> Um, a couple of novels set in Ireland, and I've, I've read one of those, and I thought it was quite a lot of fun, actually. Yeah. And the same with Mary, same with Mary and Zimmer Bradley. And I know there are problems with Zimmer Bradley. Um, <laughs> you know, there have been scandals, to put it mildly. Right. Um, but I actually really enjoyed Mrs. of Avalon when it came out, and I got a lot out of it. And it wasn't until later again that I started thinking, is this really a feminist work, actually? Because <laughs> right. the women they spend so much, and okay, the impression of patriarchy, but they spend so much time stabbing each other in the back and being unpleasant to this other. Is this really feminist? And I kind of had to think no. But at the same time, it's a very evocative, resonant work, whatever the failings, and they were considerable, of the author. Yeah. So I think fantasy does have a big role to play, 
But um, what we want to avoid is getting it shelved onto the fiction, onto the non-fiction shelf. Right. And a friend of mine who's a medieval, friend of mine is a medieval Welsh professional, medieval Welsh historian and academic, and she came to Glastonbury to visit us a few years ago, and she did actually find a copy of Mists of Avalon in a bookshop under the history oh, section. No. <laughs> oh, oh, no, God. no. But instead of, instead of kind of having a, a meltdown, she just took it off the history and stuck it into the fiction section. That's nothing. <laughs> But, well, that, um, that, that yeah, was I mean, considerable restraint on her part. <laughs> yeah, considerable restraint. She's a very patient person. And um, I think that sort of thing we want to avoid. So you've got to draw a difference between artistic license, romantic truth, uh, which is um, a, an expression Ronald Hutton uses about some of the origin myths of modern paganism. You know, it's a romantic truth. It's not actual historical factual truth right so you know so there's an epistemic difference that we can make um, with some of these things but um, you know i take myth and i play around with it and i change it so i can't really criticize other people for doing that <laughs> exactly that i i myself am also a writer i'm not uh, nearly as accomplished as you are <laughs> but uh yeah it, it, i think uh, it, it just it just makes for good for for good writing if you're able to kind of like embellish things out a little bit and bring them to an eventual end point you know but you do have that lovely little you can stick a, a little sticker that says this is fiction on your book and <laughs> people understand Absolutely. that yeah as long as it's shelved in the right places it's in the right, right category i've just done a, a novel i've got the novel out at the same time as miracles um it's called comet weather just a brief plug for commercials here oh, yeah, yeah. it's set in Somerset, and it actually uses a lot of renaissance astrology there are there are star spirits called the bohemian stars and the bohemian stars are real pieces of renaissance star magic and they are personified they've each um they, they've got they, they take human sort of humanoid form oh. and they have uh, different colors different associations, different crystals, different herbs associated with them. And in the original Renaissance text, some of those spirits are actually male, but I made them all female. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's that's me taking something and, and kind of appropriating it. I, I'll totally cop to that. Right. Um, but because it fitted the, the structure and the plot of the book and the theme of the book more. So, I'll you know, I'll, I'll, I should say in the next novel, you know, there, there is evidence that these... these entities are male as well but um, but i happen to do something else with it right yeah so, and you know people do that with the celtic background of these islands a lot <laughs> um, and so, sometimes it's irritating i have to say and sometimes it seems perfectly justified actually because um you know as my medieval historian friend says if you're actually writing about medieval wales there's an awful lot of violence and mud mm. and there's kind of not a lot else right <laughs> you know these are things were basic times um, so you know, although the idea that we had an ancient priestess and the matriarchy and all the rest of it um, is is very romantic and fanciful and not actually factual, right. it's still more exciting for the plot of a fiction book. Yeah, the, the, so, to use a kind of uh, justification there. yeah, to use a kind of crude phrase that we we occasionally, uh, my husband and I will use, is uh, talk about a metaphysical dick waving that people do. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I think that's a great phrase. Yeah. And um, I think the only thing is, it's when it starts bleeding into non-fiction and you get things like the infamous Irish potato goddess. No, <laughs> you know, that's, that sort of stuff, you've got to put a stop to that because that's really quite dangerous misinformation, actually. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it's taking somebody's history and it's, it's distorting it. And, um, you know, in a, in a, a place which was subject to significant colonialism from the English and, and abuse. And it's, you know, we don't want to perpetuate that sort of thing. Not at all. So, not um, so not in any way. Fine, it's a fine line, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Um, so, yeah, I, I had... I was thinking about this and kind of still formulating the question in my head. So, forgive me, it might come out a little bleh, but... Um, <laughs> so... Um, here in in the uh, in the Americas in general, um, there's been a lot of uptick in the worship of a deity called Santa Morta, and um, yes, yeah, and it's really interesting because she's a created deity. You know, she yes. there's she's not in the history anywhere. Um, do you have any any thoughts about that? Like, how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm fine with it actually. She's uh, she's worshipped over here to to a certain extent. 
um, in places like Bolton, which if you know Bolton, is just the most bizarre thing. It's a small northern industrial town, huh. uh, but there is a section of cult up there. And I know there's people in South Wales who um, are involved in the worship of Santa Muerte as well. Um, she is a she's a created folk saint, isn't she? Right, yeah, yeah. Um, she's like St. Expedite, um, who is one of my favourite folk saints, you know. He's, yes. His, his origins are just bizarre. You know about his origins. Yes, you know, yes, right? I do. <laughs> yeah. you, you're yes, talking I folk mean, magic you know, now. A, that's where I get down. <laughs> with expedites on it and a Roman statue of a Roman soldier in it. Yeah. But I have called upon St. Expedite in terms of great finance financial um, necessity yeah. and St. Expedite by God has come up with the goods <laughs> yes, yes, so absolutely. who am I to say that just because they're made up doesn't mean they're not real right and um, this this is like a big ontological question yeah. because at some point um, either you can say and this you know if we knew the answer to this obviously we would be theological heroes but right. we're not um, you know at some point worship of everything has to start everywhere Right. And somewhere. And so, you know, Aphrodite is now an ancient goddess, but she had origins in smaller cults around the Mediterranean. She is sort of syncretic. People took little spirits and kind of eventually a goddess evolved out of all these different types of entities with different attributes, which right. is why some of the ancient goddesses and goddesses have such a bizarrely wide range of attributes. Yes. <laughs> uh, because originally they were all individual spirits. Yes. Uh, but their worship had to start somewhere. I am not here to say whether there is an entity out there that suddenly decides to come through and contact people or whether it is the other way around, whether we, through our imaginative capacity create that entity or out of need um, <laughs> you know in desperation you know, what, what can't be denied is that they do often seem to work whatever however you define work right as long as they're they're doing the thing that you're asking them to do <laughs> uh, yeah within reason i mean gods and goddesses usually don't actually they take they take you literally they don't understand human problems very well right you know so it's it's a very we all know this it's <laughs> It's, it's, it's terribly fraught um, but I think um, you know I think Santa Muerte is, is a fascinating deity and she obviously has emerged from wherever in response to a human need yes yeah. and her popularity really kind of um, you know reflects that but voodoo um, is very much a you know, a candomblé or it's various forms all that those sorts of folk religions they're very um organic and fast developing yes you yes. know they come out from the ground up and um they're not primitive religions they're sophisticated religions um that are emerging according to um you know sociological dictates and context so as the context changes the deities change and it's quite fast i mean the catholic church used to be a bit like this and i think in medieval times because I, I wish i could find an act i need to look up the reference but i came across a saint um and this is sort of just about when the reformation was happening and she was somewhere in the midlands but you, you could go to her if you wanted your husband stiffed <laughs> so you could pray and she would take out like a sort of um you know theological hit woman she would take out your husband for you and when the the, the church turned up to kind of shut this this shrine down they found this massive queue oh my. going you won't believe what he did next. And I said, that's what we, we've got to go. We've got to do something about this. So they've gone to the saint to sort him out. And I just thought, God, you know, that's so unchristian, really. Right, right. A lot, of, a lot of the early Catholic saints and, and Christian saints were not, uh, they weren't meek, mild, gentle, compassionate. You know, they were these terrifying sort of forces. Right. And, um, and I think the voodoo pantheon is much more similar to that. That um, makes sense. And probably much more like the, the deities of the ancient world um, than it is like the sort of big four religions today. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Um, so one more question, and then I think I'm going to cut you loose. Um, let you get on with your life for a minute. Um, <laughs> we, we talk a lot, especially um, in, in our pagan community, which is uh, the metro Detroit area. So you're talking southeast lower Michigan. 
Uh, okay. So, so the one that looks like a mitten in just kind of that lower thumb area. That's where we're at. Okay. Yes, I, okay. <laughs> um, cool. We we talk a lot about uh, cultural appropriation here, uh, just because yes. uh, we're a very diverse uh, community, as you might imagine. Yes. Um, I, how is that playing out in the UK right now? How are you guys uh, kind of uh, trying to find your way through that kind of uh, prickery slope that is uh, cultural appropriation versus what is, um, you know, yes. religious? Um, yes, it's, it's, it's a big issue. And, um, and we, we are usually sociologically, as a culture, a little bit behind the states. So the states, you know, tends to sort of feed back what it's doing. Um, in terms of, of social context and cultural context and so on. Um, cultural appropriation, though, is a big issue, and I think it's a genuine issue. Yeah. And I think, again, there's that, there's the question, there are lots of questions surrounding it. One of those question dynamics is, again, this, um, uh, are spirits real? Right. Because if they are real, um, then we may presume that they come to you and mm. approach you. And in the Voodoo tradition, there is this thing that everybody has a Lua who walks with them right. uh, when they're born. Yeah. So, um, you know, so it's it's uh, so we, we all have one, whatever nationality and race we are. Right. And I think that's that's fine if it's coming from that part of the culture. And um, you know, black practitioners of Voodoo are saying this is actually the case. Mm -hmm. um, where you run into problems, obviously, is the kind of weekend workshop warrior who <laughs> does a course on shamanism for like two days and then decides that they're an expert. Right. They know more about it than the actual practitioners of that religion or the or the people who've actually been grown up, you know, have grown up with it. You know, you, we don't know that much. Um, so I've known a couple of voodoo practitioners who are white in this country who don't mm. actually do that. They're not prepared to go the full way and become a hunger because that's a massive undertaking. Yes. And there are issues with cultural appropriation with that. Yeah. You know, if you suddenly, especially it's it, because the whole thing about cultural appropriation is that the, this power differential, you know, and the black community in this country um, is not as privileged as the white community. There mm. is a lot of institutionalized and, and overt racism here. Mm. And if you start taking voodoo and running um, workshops on it, and you're white and middle class and British, um, I don't think that's a good look. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I get you. I get, that, yeah. Yeah. I've only organized one voodoo workshop in Glastonbury, and that was with a Hungan who is Puerto Rican, and he came over from New York. We flew him in. Ah, yes, yes. But we wouldn't have tried to do it. Um, you, you have time to hold ceremonies. I mean, if, if a, I believe that the spirits and the entities, the Loire, the gods, whatever, are externally real i believe they're objectively real but that's just me right um so i tend to believe that if you do something they don't like they will kick your ass Th yeah uh, that that's my belief as well um <laughs> that's always kind of been my so, thing so yeah so so that's where i am on the whole cultural appropriation thing i think you have to be sensitive to people's concerns because they are legitimate concerns and you also can't treat um uh, one nationality or ethnicity as a monolithic block uh, you know, it's not the case that um, all Nigerians think the same. It is not the case that all Yoruba think the same right. about their own religion. They're going to, you're going to have different opinions. Right. Um, and, and you so can't really you go individual by individual. individual. Yeah, absolutely. You need to treat people as individuals. Yeah. Um, you know, so I have, I have, for example, done a little bit of work um, with one of the Yoruba spirits Okay. And that was because that was because I was asked to um, by somebody who is Nigerian. Ah, okay. And you, you sometimes get that, and I had to say, I'm going to have to rock up on the astral to this entity and say, mm. I have no idea what I'm doing, white girl. Yep. And just <laughs> you know, and just just kind of, and we we handled it very very carefully and delicately. And in the end, my friend said, I think you probably are going to need to step back. Yeah. Uh, this is how you do it. It's what you do. So I did that, and sure enough, I, I had been having um, fairly significant dreams about, which I don't normally have in mm. that particular way, about a, a, a different sort of correspondences and so on. And um, after we'd sort of done the separation bit, then that didn't happen anymore. Right. Um, but I would only ever do, I wouldn't do it for experimentation, um, <laughs> and I wouldn't do it for fun, certainly. I did it because I was asked. 
Right, right. You know, and most of us do follow this edict of going where we're needed and doing what is needed and things like that. So, yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But I think you've, you've got to be careful. But, um, you know, the idea that I could sort of set myself up, I spent a while in Siberia. I know Siberian shamans. I know a little bit about the practice, but the idea that I would then go up and set myself up as some kind of si- Siberian influence shaman is just actually outrageous. Yes. You know, I don't know enough. I don't come from that background. Um, so, you know, I follow my own uh, particular path, and that tends to be indigenous British as far as we can. Right. There's a lot of it we don't know. Um, and I know where my, my spiritual tradition actually comes from, and it's most of that's in the book. Right. Um, but I think, um, you know, again, I don't want to be nationalistic about it and say that if you're Chinese, I have Chinese magical students, if you're Chinese, you can't come over here and start studying Druidry. Why the hell not? Right, right. You know, if, they, if they feel that that's appropriate to them, you know, with the cultural appropriation caveat, right. you know, let's, let's, let's see how it goes. Because sometimes I think people do get um, approached by entities who want to work with them, and they don't always have a big say in the matter. Right, yeah. Usually it's a, uh, we're working together now. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is what yeah, I'm doing, yeah. I guess. And you're like, oh, are we? Okay. <laughs> this yeah, is where we are now. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think, you know, if, you, if you're serious about paganism and you can put your ego aside and you've had experience of getting your ass kicked, uh, which is very helpful, Yes. Uh, then I think, um, you know, you, sh- you should be okay. But you've got to deal with it sensitively and you can't, treat other people's cultures as just something that you're entitled to right right exactly all right well uh liz this has been absolutely fascinating um i I just want to go ahead and i'm going to encourage folks to uh read your your new book which is about miracles in your own making a history of paganism and uh also check out the non-fiction fiction works too liz is awesome and you should you should definitely read her stuff thank so, you all right you're welcome thank and you. well, thank it's been a pleasure thank you for asking such interesting questions it's been a great pleasure well thank you it's been it's been so much fun thanks so much and uh we'll talk maybe we'll talk again soon i hope so thank i hope you so, so much thank you bye-bye okay bye-bye this ppt presents broadcast is brought to you by tech Witch detroit TechWitch Detroit for all your IT needs. Please visit us on the web at techwitchdetroit.com. TechWitch Detroit, we can help. You have just listened to a Pagan Pathways Temple Broadcast Network recording. Pagan Pathways Temple is a 5013C not for profit organization out of beautiful Madison Heights, Michigan. We offer classes, community outreach, event space, and a library available to our members. To find out more or to become a member, please go to PaganPathwaysTemple.org. Pagan Pathways Temple, growing in the old ways where all paths are open.